Now, one of our most distinguished composers died today. Sir John Taverner was 69, a deeply religious man who had been plagued by ill health for much of his life. The pain, he said this summer, had made him terribly grateful for every moment he had left. Let's hear a little of his work. Well, with us now are the soprano Patricia Rosario, for whom Taverner composed over 30 works, and the composer Michael Lord Barclay, who was friends with Taverner during their childhoods and whose father tutored Taverner. How big a loss do you think he is? It's quite a considerable loss because he forged a very individual voice. Um, he's rather like the English Arvo Pert. You know, he spoke to a huge number of people. He started off as a very avant-garde composer after he'd worked mm. with my father, wrote pieces like The Whale, which the Beatles loved so much that they got Apple to record it, which is pretty amazing achievement, oh. um, and Celtic Requiem, Ultimus Ritos. These pieces were at the forefront of the avant-garde. Um, and then he retreated into a much more spiritual world, like Arvo Pert, strangely enough, and found a kind of uh, language which was both sensuous and very meditative. And I think it appealed to a need in people, in society, for something that was spiritual, which allowed people to look inside themselves and see their place in a wider world. What was he like? You had the thrill of having him compose pieces for you specifically, mm -hmm. but you, and you obviously performed for him. Yes. What was that relationship like? Well, it was very intense because um, after I did his opera, Mary of Egypt, he started to write a lot of pieces for soprano voice. I think he studied my voice while I was doing his opera. And the pieces he wrote for me, they, they, were, they got more and more complex and difficult, but they always seemed to fit my voice. Um, and he had a very particular sound in his mind. So working together to achieve that was quite difficult. Um, but I, I think I managed to, to, to Was he intimidating? Sometimes, yes. <laughs> yes, and, and I think he... Um, no, it was just that his, he really pushed the voice, I think even with his choral music, to the extremes. I mean, I never sang as low as I've, I've sung in his music, and I've never sung as high, although Arvo Paird wrote a piece which went as high. But uh, it was consistently, I mean, I sang in the Albert Hall where I had to start on a D in alt, that's two and a bit octaves above middle C. And it was up in the gods and it just, the orchestra were down there and I just had to s hit this note and hold it for several bars. Um, but he was, he was also, you know, very, very human in that mm. he had a great sense of humor and working with him was, was quite, you know, Good fun. You're agreeing quite emphatically. A absolutely. I mean, although John had a slightly monastic side, he liked the finer things of life. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, amplify. Yeah, well, fine food and, uh, um, and when he was younger, girls. Um, and he, you know, he, he wasn't part of that Beatles mm. set for nothing. He used to have this wonderful white suit mm. with a white scarf. He had Marfan, Marfan syndrome, which explains why he was so tall and why he had this congenital heart problem, which killed his brother and then mm. sadly has killed him. But together with the white suit and the white scarf, there was a white Rolls Royce, <laughs> <laughs> even when he couldn't really afford it. And he went, he cut a wonderful figure. So you had, on the one hand, this sort of great mystic and this really naughty boy about town, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I rather liked. He, 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 what was his relationship with the establishment like, the musical establishment? Um, I think they found him hard to accept for a while because, you know, when people actually strike a chord, you know, write the... Uh, uh, the, the song for Athene that was done at Princess Diana's funeral, that kind of thing. Critics uh, and the establishment look a bit askance. Um, but at the end of the day, you shouldn't give a damn about that. At the end of the day, does the music speak to you or not? And his music does speak to millions of people. After mm. all, Jeremy, he did a seven-hour vigil, which people sat mm. through entranced. Mm. And um, he had that yeah. ability to take people on a journey. Did you have any sense of, 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 of why he struck this chord? What it was about his music or his presence coming through his music? Do you know, I think he really connected with the spiritual. 
Mm. And he took risks to achieve that. I mean, he actually explored not just um, Western music. He, he, I, when I first met him, he played Indian classical music to me. We sat and listened to some rags and he loved Indian music. And I think he often uh, tried to get program organizers to this, this piece you mentioned, which was seven hours long. We started at 10 o'clock at night and finished at, uh, with the dawn. And it's a very Indian idea. Mm. And, and I think, you know. It's a happening. Exactly, it really is. We, um, and he drew instruments from China, from India, into, most people said, oh, it's very inconvenient. But actually, <laughs> it, it brought another dimension in even Middle Eastern elements. I mean, not everything was happen. a masterpiece, but a lot of it was really wonderful and touched a chord. You're both very kind. Thanks very much. Thanks.